Hello everyone. My name's Craig Dunn and I work on the documentation team for mobile developer tools at Microsoft. Today I want to show you how to integrate new iOS 11 features into your Xamarin apps using C Sharp and Visual Studio. Here's an agenda for the webinar. I want to start with a demo first to show off the features we'll be talking about. Then I'll discuss each feature in more detail, starting with large titles and search, then row actions, safe area and margins, face ID, map kit, and core ML. I've got a combination of pseudocode and live demos to explain each one. Finally, there'll be more time for questions and links to all the code and samples being discussed, which will also be posted in the chat window. By the end of this webinar, you should be able to take these ideas and code samples to add iOS 11 support to your own apps or to build something new. A reminder that you can build iOS apps using Xamarin and Visual Studio for Mac, and also with Visual Studio 2017 on Windows, so long as you have a Mac on the network. The Mac acts as a remote build server for Windows and also lets you use the remoted iOS simulator. It can be a MacBook Pro, an iMac, or even a Mac Mini without a monitor connected. Xamarin development with Visual Studio works fine in the free community edition, as well as professional and enterprise. If you have any questions during the webinar, please ask them in the discussion box at any time. We have a team of experts waiting to help you out. To show how iOS 11 features can be added to existing apps, I've taken an old to-do sample and updated it. First, I added GPS coordinates and photos and turned it into a list of things to do on holiday. Because I was recently in Seattle, I've taken inspiration from my trip and added a whole list of things to do there. Now let's see to-do 11 in action. To begin, the app requires login. The simulator can act as though it supports Face ID using the hardware menu. Once logged in, I can scroll up to make the large titles disappear and scroll down to see the search bar. I can also swipe left and swipe right to expose different row functions. I mentioned that GPS data was added to the app. That was so I could have a map view of the places I want to visit. It shows both incomplete and done items with different colored markers, and the new clustering feature provides a summary where the markers are close together. Clicking on a row takes us to the to-do item details, where I can add a photo and use machine learning to identify the subject. The circular button's laid out using the safe area defined by iOS 11, so they don't interfere with the home indicator or the sensor area when rotated. And last but not least, with the iPad simulator, I can demonstrate dragging and dropping into other apps. Let's jump over there now. And if I drag a row from the to-do app, notice the different animations and visual effects that occur as the data is moved back and forth. I can also drag and drop within the app and from other apps. Before heading back to the slides, let's take a quick look at the Visual Studio solution. If you're looking for the storyboard file, it's in the base LProj folder because this sample has been localized into different languages. The translations are visible in the resources folder, along with the image assets. The packages folder contains the SQLite NuGet packages, which are used for data storage. The remaining folders contain helper classes for different features. And below that, all of the code for the view controller used in the app. You'll notice some class names have been repeated with a suffix, like plus drag and plus drop. This is my attempt to make the sample easy to navigate by using partial classes to group together feature-specific code. There's nothing special about a plus in the file name, but you'll see why it's useful. First up, perhaps the most obvious visual change in iOS 11 apps, the larger title font and search behavior. You can see this new layout in almost all the built-in apps, from mail to settings, along with custom styling and the pull-down search box. To do 11 incorporates all these features, shown here in my favorite color, green. These features are configured on the navigation controller and its children. I've extracted the relevant code here so it's easier to follow. Enabling large titles only requires prefers large titles be set to true. It's a property of the navigation bar, and I set it in the UI navigation controller's view did load method. If I don't do anything else, the navigation controller will always have large titles. For most cases, we want subsequent view controllers to revert to normal size headings which is done by setting the large titles display mode to never. This should be added to the second view controller in the navigation stack. In the sample app, that's the detail view controller. Branding is also as important as ever, 
so most apps take advantage of the Appearance APIs to customize colors and other properties. There's a new Appearance property, Large Title Text Attributes, that applies to the new Large Title Text. In the Sample app, you can find this is set in the App Delegate class. Implementing the search takes a little more work, so let's look at the code. It's been grouped into a single partial class, Table View Controller plus Search. First, you'll see the IUI Search Results Updating interface. Implementing this means we can use the class here. In this method, called by view did load, I create everything, configuring this UI search controller, setting it to the navigation item search controller property. And there's a line of code commented out here, but we'll come back to that later. Then the update search results for search controller method, which is required by the interface, does the hard work of performing the search. Switching back to the simulator, I can go back to the main screen and because I'm on holiday in Seattle, I'll search for coffee. The search results work fine, but notice when I choose one, the detail view controller doesn't have a navigation bar. It looks like a bug, but there's an easy fix. I need to uncomment this defines presentation context equals true line so that the segue when it's used is based in that UV controller. So I've restarted the app and once the debugging session can begin, I'll quickly log in again, hardware matching face, and this time I'll search for parks. And when we click on that, the view controller has a navigation bar as we expect. Row actions on the right hand side of a table view were already supported in iOS using a table delegate to set the editing style and implementation. iOS 11 adds a new swipe action that can be added to both sides of the table with one or more options. Although the new swipe actions can be used on both sides, in the sample code I've kept the delete implementation using backwards compatible methods. The green done swipe action on the left hand side uses the new iOS 11 API. This screenshot cheats a bit by showing them both at the same time, so let's look at the real thing. Switching back over to Visual Studio for Mac, we'll see the code in the Table View Controller plus Row Actions partial class. The delete action is implemented to be backwards compatible. It uses the familiar candidate row and commit editing style methods. The right swipe is accomplished with new methods. Conceptual done action which is an object that describes the action, including the title and a lambda that performs the underlying operation. The second method, get leading swipe action configuration, is an overload that attaches the action to the table. There's only one option, whether a full swipe automatically performs the action, which we'll see more closely now. Switching to the simulator, here is Ah, the table with both left and right swipe actions. By default, you have to expose and then click on the action button, but a full swipe across will act as a shortcut. Notice how the action text or image jumps across to indicate that the full swipe gesture is about to be triggered. The left swipe shortcut even changes images to indicate what action is going to be performed. This next feature is useful for all iOS devices but in particular for the new iPhone X. I'm talking about the Safe Area Layout Guide and Margin Layout Guide properties. Using these guides will help you to place controls so that they're easy to use without interfering with the home indicator and without being hidden by the sensor area or round corners of the new iPhone. The blue regions shown here represent the Safe Area Layout Guide. Notice how it represents a rectangular area that's not obscured by the hardware or software affordances of the iPhone X. On other devices, the blue area fills the rectangular screen, so you generally wouldn't see a difference in layout. Hit targets and important information should be laid out within the safe area. Text is hard to read when it's flush against the side of the screen, so there is a margin layout guide that provides a margin on both sides of the screen. The margin layout is shown here in light blue. Align text to the margin guide to achieve consistent spacing between the text and the screen edge. On the iPhone X, the margin layout guide also avoids the corners and sensor area, 
but on other devices it will extend to the top and bottom of the container. Navigation controllers, table views, and collection views all adhere automatically to the Safe Area Layout Guide. Here's a landscape screenshot of Todo 11, with the blue lines indicating where the Safe Area Layout Guide ends. The navigation bar and table cells have automatically been sized to fit within the safe area, but notice how the cells can scroll behind the home indicator. The human interface guidelines suggest that scrolling table content, as well as other view elements like maps, backgrounds and images, can bleed right to the edge of the view, including behind the home indicator and the round corners. The map view in the sample is an example of bleeding content to the edges of the screen. Let's look at a few specific code snippets. This slide is showing the bottom of the photo view controller in the to do 11 sample. These controls have all been positioned using the safe area and margins, and I've extracted the relevant code to discuss. Firstly, I've created a local safe guide variable that represents the safe area layout guide, and then created some constraints to lay out the close button aligned to the bottom right of the screen. To achieve that effect, the trailing and bottom anchors for the close button are set using the constraint equal to method, with offsets of negative 23 and negative 13 relative to the trailing and bottom anchors of the safe area. The width and height of the button are hard coded to 60. As you can see, the button is positioned well above the home indicator on the iPhone 10. For comparison, on the iPhone 8, the button appears snugly along the bottom above the screen. Using the Safe Area Layout Guide is the best way to lay out your views for all device types. The Camera button is located next to the Close button. For the bottom anchor, it is constrained to the Safe Area's bottom anchor, the same as the previous example. But, for the horizontal positioning, we use the Close button as our reference point, using its leading anchor as the constraint for the camera button's trailing anchor, with a negative 23 offset. The remaining buttons are all positioned the same way using the bottom anchor of the safe area and leading anchor of the control next door, and negative offsets because we're positioning them from right to left. The text label above the buttons is positioned slightly differently. I've created a local variable for the margin guide, and the leading and trailing anchors for the label are set to the margin guide's leading and trailing anchors. Notice there are no offsets used. The margin guide is already taking the side spacing into account. To ensure that the label appears above the buttons, its bottom anchor is constrained to the top of the close button, with a negative 13 offset. Using the Safe Area Layout Guide and Layout Margins Guide ensures that your controls are placed correctly on different devices, form factors, and on rotation. Here are the controls on the iPhone 10 and iPhone 8 in portrait and landscape mode to give you an idea of the effect the safe area in particular has on screen layout. Now I want to talk about Face ID. Face ID is part of the local authentication framework, same as Touch ID. So if your app already uses fingerprint authentication, it will be easy to update. In fact, the authorization code is exactly the same. The human interface guidelines for Face ID suggest that you detect what authentication method is available on the device and make it clear to the user iOS 11 adds APIs to help with this. iOS 11 also requires a privacy message for using Face ID, which was not a requirement for Touch ID. The ToDo 11 sample detects whether Touch ID or Face ID are available and sets the login button text to reflect that. As this screenshot shows, the button text is login with Face ID. This slide shows the relevant APIs to detect what authentication method is supported by a device. Firstly, Create an LA context to access the local authentication framework. Then use the can evaluate policy method to query for device support. Pass policy type device owner authentication or device owner authentication with biometrics to determine if a pin or face or fingerprint recognition is supported. If the biometrics query returns true, use the biometry type to determine whether face ID or touch ID is present and use this information to present the user with the correct login information. To actually perform authentication, use an LA context object to call the evaluate policy method with the correct policy type. Always call can evaluate policy first so that you only attempt to authenticate with a method the device supports. 
To support both new and old devices, your app will need to implement support for both biometric and PIN or password login. Let's switch back to Visual Studio for Mac to see the implementation in ToDo 11. To secure my holiday to-do list, here's the authentication behavior I want. The user must authenticate when the app starts, and also if the app goes to the background and then returns to the foreground. It should work regardless of whether they use the device pin, touch ID, or face ID. Let's see how the ToDo 11 app meets these goals, and whether you're on the iPhone or whether you're on the iPad with a pin. As I mentioned earlier, Face ID support requires a privacy string in the InfoP list file. The NS Face ID usage description key must be set with a message to explain why the app is secured. Without this key, the app will not work with Face ID. The code appears in two places. The first is the local auth view controller. This is where the actual login takes place. First, in view will appear, we use the can evaluate policy method and the can evaluate policy method without the biometrics request to determine what the login text will be and set the button to reflect that. In the authenticate method, we use the can evaluate policy again to determine whether biometrics are available and then we use the evaluate policy method with or without biometrics to perform the actual authentication. In the navigation controller, we keep a Boolean variable that keeps track of the authenticated status, and we provide an authenticate method that instantiates the local auth view controller and pops it open to request an authentication. To take care of authentication when the app goes into the background, we set the authentication variable to false, and when it enters the foreground, we pop open the view controller again. So with the code sprinkled amongst these few classes, we get the authentication behavior uh, that we were looking for. Now I'm going to switch to an iPad-only feature, drag and drop. You can think of the two operations as being distinct. You could choose to implement just drag or just drop, but it's obviously better for the user to support both. This functionality has a high degree of customization. You can start by using the built-in helper functionality in table views and collection views, but you can also make any arbitrary view draggable or into a drop target. You can add support for complex data types, customized drag preview imagery, and spring load controls to help users navigate to a specific drop location in your app. Adding drag support to a table view can be done in a single method, I've extracted the relevant code here. Implement the IUI table view drag delegate, and don't forget to assign this delegate to the table view property, and add code for the method get items for beginning drag session. The code has three main parts. First, extract the data to be dragged using the index path passed to the method and encode to an NS data object. Second, Create an NS item provider class and register the data representation as plain text and the visibility to all, which means any application can receive this drag. Then create a completion handler that returns the data. This is the method that gets called when the drop finishes. And third, we return an array of UI drag item. iOS uses this data to manage animations, icons, and supplying data to the target app. An array is used because drag and drop supports multi-touch and more than one item can be dragged at a time. For more advanced behavior, you can register multiple representations, for example, a rich text version or a custom class. And you can use different levels of visibility, such as limiting dragging to other apps in the same team or group. To support drop, implement the IUI table view drop delegate interface and assign it as the drop delegate on this table view. Then implement three methods, the first two of which are shown here. The first one, can handle drop session, 
tells iOS what types of data the table view can accept. This is called to determine whether the drag preview will indicate the data can be dropped or not. The second one, drop session did update, is called when the user is dragging their finger around the screen. Each control must respond, indicating whether a move or copy operation would result. In general, if the drag is occurring in the same app, you'll model it as a move operation, but if the data is coming from another app, it will behave like copy. The third and final method required is shown on this slide, perform drop. As the name indicates, this is the method that does the actual work when your finger is lifted from the screen. The parameters are the control being dropped on and a coordinator object containing all the details of the data being dropped. For a table view, this processing is done inside a begin updates transaction so that multiple items can be added to the table view and the backing data store. When end updates is called, the new row or rows are animated into place. Let's see it in action and take a look at the actual code. Once again, we'll start with drag. Here in the table view controller plus drag partial class, we can find the single method that's required to support dragging. The first thing to notice is the class implements the IUI table view drag delegate interface, which requires the get items for beginning drag session method. The code here is a little more complex than what I showed on the slide. After retrieving the contents of the cell being dragged, I've added this snippet to customize the drop text to include a done message and then encode to NS data. Finally, we create the item provider as previously described and return the array of UI drag item. Now let's go back to the simulator and see it in action. When I begin a drag, the animation lifts off the screen and when it's ready to be dropped, you'll see a plus, green plus, appear to indicate that that operation is available. See the additional adornment of a done string, which I added to customize the drag data. Now let's move on to drop. Once again, we can find the required interface being implemented by the partial class. And then the three methods that we introduced earlier. Can handle drop session informs the current drag operation of what data types this control can accept. Drop session did update is called while data is being dragged over the control to help iOS render the visual cues. Has active drag indicates the drag is from this table, so it's really a move operation. Moving more than one row is not allowed, but if one row is being moved, then we will allow it to occur. If the drag isn't coming from this table, it is modeled as a copy. And finally, the perform drop method, which is where all the real work is done. It has two parts. The first part is determining where the drop will take place using the supplied destination index path. The second part of the method uses the sessions load objects method, where we get the strings that are being dragged into the list and then simultaneously add them to the SQLite data store and the table view. This is wrapped inside a begin updates, end updates transaction, so the new data can be animated in without reloading the entire table. Switching back to the iPad, I can test the perform drop method by dragging data into the table view. You can see if I just move slightly, the gray indicator says you, there's no operation, but as min, the minute I move further, the drag operation is allowed. Uh, similarly, if I move data from the other app, when it uh, appears over to do, the green plus sign informs the user that you know a drag operation is going to copy data across. Now it's time to look at MapKit. I added latitude and longitude to this app specifically to show off this new feature, clustered markers. As I visit each Seattle landmark, I can mark them as done. The map view lets me easily see which places I've yet to visit. They're in red, while the ones I've been to are in green. I've reused code from one of Apple's samples so that the clustered marker show a count and a ring graph of the proportion of markers that are done versus not yet visited. As I zoom in and out, the clusters are updated and individual pins emerge.
If you already have a map that renders annotations, adding the clustering support only requires a few changes. Firstly, you need to add a clustering identifier to your annotation view, and register a view class to be used when rendering clusters, which we'll see on the next slide. Implementing the cluster view is similar to any other map annotation view class, except that it represents an MK cluster annotation, and will have a member annotations property that represents the pins being clustered together. This information gets used when generating the cluster view. In the ToDo11 app, it's used to generate the ring graph of done versus not yet visited locations. The full code isn't shown here. Finally, update the getView for annotation method, and if a cluster view is required, return an instance for the map to render. Remember to use the correct reuse identifier. Time for another demo so we can watch the animations as I zoom. The code to support these markers is all in the MapViewController plus annotations partial class and supporting classes in the map markers folder. The to do view and to do annotation classes would work on any version of iOS. Uh, they just represent the individual markers and require no change. The cluster view also inherits from MK annotation view, but it represents a cluster and has these additional properties, display priority and collision mode, that help inform the map's rendering of clustered annotations. If we go down to the map view controller, we add this additional line to register the cluster view with a cluster view reuse identifier in addition to the regular view. And then we update the method that returns annotations to the map when it's being displayed. We check for annotations that are of type MK cluster annotation, and we return instances of our view as required. If we go back to the view class, you can see the draw method uses a member annotations collection, which is a summary of all of the pins that are being represented by that cluster, and the core graphics class, which renders the um, little ring graph for us. So let's see it in action on the simulator. Uh, and it works best if we do some zooming in and out, and you can see the pins animate together and animate apart as we zoom, and the numbers indicate the pins that have been summarized, and the ring graph indicates what's done, what's still to be seen to help me uh, sightseeing in Seattle. The last framework I'm going to talk about is CoreML, the machine learning framework. CoreML allows apps to load existing machine learning models and run them on the device. You can argue that the ToDo11 app doesn't need any machine learning, but just for fun, I've added CoreML-based feature recognition each time a photo is added. I've used an existing image processing model from Apple to describe the photos. There are other models available from Apple, and you can use converters to bring models from other tools like TensorFlow, or even create your own vision processing models from scratch using Azure Custom Vision. At a high level, the steps to incorporate machine learning models into an app are as follows. First, download an existing model, either from Apple or another source, such as Azure Cognitive Services. Double-clicking on the model file from Apple will show a summary window, which contains important information about how to use the model. This information is for the VGG16 model provided by Apple. In the screenshot, we can see the input and output parameter names and types. The input is a color image that is 224 pixels square, and there are two outputs, a string which is the most likely result and a dictionary of results with their probability. Note the parameter names are image and class label props, since we need these in the code later. After downloading, you can compile the model for CoreML and then add it to your project in the resources folder. The following code snippets show how a model can be loaded and run. Due to the added error handling, it doesn't look quite so neat in the actual sample. Once the model has been created, input parameters are packaged in an NS dictionary. The photo passed in must be 224 pixels square, which we saw in the previous slide, and the key for the dictionary is the parameter name image. A CoreML specific ML dictionary feature provider class wraps the parameters which is then passed to the getPrediction method 
which is where the magic happens. The results are returned in another dictionary and can be referenced using the names we saw earlier, such as class label probs. We can then iterate over the results and display them to the user. Because the get prediction method is effectively running in the background, displaying results to the user should be done on the main UI thread. On to the last demo. Each time I take a photo, I want to use machine learning to categorize the photo's main subject, and this is how to make that happen. CoreML doesn't specifically need any info plist updates, but because I want to do image processing on the user's pictures, I've added privacy keys for the photo library and camera. Now, to set up a machine learning model, I started at apple.com, where a variety of models are available for download. I'm choosing the last one because it's the biggest, and so I'm guessing it's good. Once the VGG model is downloaded, which we'll just have to wait for, ah, I can double click on it to see details. It shows the inputs and outputs as we just discussed. To get the model into the Xamarin app, first I'm going to compile it using the terminal. So let me just change directory into the downloads folder and the XC run is an Xcode utility, uh, core ML compiler, compile, and the name of the model that we just downloaded, which is vgg.mlmodel out there. And I mistyped that, it's vgg16. Let me just fix it up. And what this does is convert the ML model format into a compiled format. Uh, which is easiest to add to our app. So if we now see change directory into the out directory, ls, and the output is vgg16.mlmodelc, that is a folder that we need to include all of the contents in our app. So you'll see that it has been added to the projects resources directory, and all of the files have a build action of bundle resource. So having downloaded, compiled, and added that into the solution, we can code against it. The code is in two places, the machine learning model class, which has a method to classify the image, and to invoke on the main thread, as I said, the results generation once the machine learning is complete. If we zoom into the machine learning model class, you'll see the details on, that we showed on the previous slides. First, we get a URL for the resource, which is loading it from our bundle. Uh, and then we create the model using that uh, asset path. We pack up the input parameters, which is the image that the user is supplying and calling the get prediction method. So that's the one that does all of the fancy stuff and it returns a dictionary of out features and class label probs. You can see the string there is the name of the results list that we're going to display. So imagine uh, in Seattle, I took a photo of the Space Needle. Everyone does. And so I'm going to open that and we'll run it through the machine learning model and see what it says. So the analyzing takes a second and it's chosen to recognize the traffic light in the photo with 44% uh, probability, which is pretty good. Um, doesn't actually recognize the Space Needle. Um, but that's how to incorporate Core ML. Before we go, I want to touch on one last important topic, and that is backwards compatibility. The sample app is built solely for iOS 11, as indicated in the info plist file where the deployment target is set. This means I can use all these new APIs anywhere in the code. Unfortunately, while iOS adoption, iOS 11 adoption is strong, there's still lots of iOS users on iOS 10 and older. To ensure an app can run on those devices, the deployment target needs to be set to an earlier version. iOS 9 would be very inclusive, or just target iOS 10. This will let the app be installed on those older versions, but if your code tries to use a newer framework, the app will crash. There are two ways to avoid this. The first is to check for the iOS version before using a specific API, such as this code snippet that checks for iOS 11 before setting a Face ID specific property. Note that this version check is future-proof. It will continue to return true for iOS 12 and later. The second, more granular option, 
is to check for the existence of specific Objective-C selectors before calling them. This code snippet demonstrates how to check for a specific selector, which was introduced in iOS 9, before calling the corresponding C-sharp method. Using this approach means you need to look up the Objective-C selector name bound to the method or property in your code. Use whatever version checking method you feel comfortable with. Just remember to test on older simulators and devices before releasing your app. And that's all I have to talk about today. I hope you found the demonstrations useful. Here are some resources for you to try out. Download today's sample app or visit the Xamarin iOS 11 docs at aka.ms slash Xamarin slash iOS 11. The rest of our iOS samples are also available and cover all the features of To Do 11 as well. If you don't already have Xamarin installed, visit visualstudio.com slash Xamarin and get started today. Thanks for watching. We'll be staying around to answer additional questions via the chat window.